Come into Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. And uh, we're picking back up tonight the series that I've been doing on honor. Um, I shared last week, I had somebody text me that watches on online. I don't know if it's on YouTube or on Periscope. But they, and they were kidding, but they said, enough already on this honor stuff. My toes hurt. Can we get on to something else? And so I think tonight is the last in this series. I think. And it was interesting. When the Lord laid it on my heart to start teaching on honor, um, I really didn't know the direction that I was going to go. And every week, it's the Holy Spirit will give me a word that's another part of honor. And tonight, um, the area that we're going to deal with is character. And the character is so important. It's interesting because you can develop character. You can change who you really are. Now, I'm so thankful I'm not the person I was before I was born again. I'm so thankful you're not the person you were before you were born again because now we probably wouldn't have gotten along. I don't know about you, but... Well, anyway, let's just... <clears throat> and I want to remind you, the Lord brought this to... To, to me a, a couple weeks ago when I taught on integrity this series is not, is not about you trying to be perfect to please God that's not what this is about it's about living at a level that he's empowered us to live this should be our reputation we should be people of honor that's what people should say when they talk about us you know and I've talked about being a person of your word that's how people should look at us and say you know what if they tell us they're going to do something they're going to do it I, I shared this but and I've shared it through the series, but one of the greatest compliments, two people have given me compliments. I really don't care. I don't, I don't look online to see what people say about me. I don't look on Facebook. I really don't care if the Lord lays on my heart to post something on Facebook and nobody likes it or people get mad at it. I really don't care. That's not what I'm at. Oh, look at that. I got 4,772 likes. <laughs> it really, I, my, who I am is not based on whether people like me or not. Who I am is based on whether God's happy with what I'm doing. And that's all that really matters to me. And uh, so I'm, I'm not, I, I understand this, this series on honor, our reputation, what people should say about us. But there's a couple things that people have told me that meant a lot to me. Because, number one, who they were. And Pastor Sherry years ago, probably about 10 or 11 years ago, she came to one of the conferences and she said, Pastor Jim, one of the things that I admire about you is you're always the same. She said, I can't tell if you're in the middle of the biggest battle you've ever been in or you just got the biggest victory you've ever had. I can't tell the difference. That really is how we should be. Now, I keep joking about this that, you know, I'm going to build a church and I'm going to line this back wall with mirrors because you can look at what I can look at. And, you know, faith people, we're supposed to be the same. We're supposed to be steady because we believe what the Word says. But you ought to try to get up and preach a happy message with people looking at you, as Brother John Evanzini says, like Missouri mules sucking oatmeal through a straw. And you know, they'd like to smile, but, well, I'm happy, Pastor. I got the joy of the Lord. It's just way down in my heart. <laughs> well, let it out. You know, notify your face. People should want what we have, and if they can't see it on the outside of you, they don't want anything you have. Amen. Amen. Anyway. And so the second thing, and... and uh, Debbie, uh, Pastor's wife, um, you know, when we started traveling more and more, not she and I, but Pastor and Debbie and Elizabeth and I started traveling more and more, I talked about how, you know, we had gotten a, I, I have it set up at my house so lights go on and off at different times every night, and whether I'm there or not, it looks like I'm home. And uh, I talked to her about it, and I said, you know, you can get little timers and just plug your lamps in, and, and I said, I'll bring you one, and so you're leaving in a couple of days, I'll bring you one. That was on Wednesday. Sunday night I showed up. Or no, that was on Sunday night. Wednesday night I showed up. I gave it to her. She looked at me. She goes, do you ever forget anything? She said, I, I, I'm amazed that you remembered to bring this to me. And, and uh, she said, I've never had a time where you told me I'm going to do something that you didn't follow through and do it. That's the reputation we should all have. That's what honor is. Or do people know to not even ask you because it's not going to do them any good anyway? As an administrator, my wife and I both, Elizabeth and I both, know the people that we can ask and who we can. Because we know the ones that say, yes, 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 I'll do. Remember Jesus talked about the two, which is the better one, the one that said no and went on and did it, and the one that said yes and then didn't do it either. And we always say, what about the one that says yes and follows through? 
But truthfully, the one that says no and went ahead and did it anyway is better because you weren't planning on them doing it anyway. The one that tells you yes and doesn't follow through, that can put you in a bind, especially if it's something you really need to have taken care of. So we should be people of honor. That should be our reputation. So we've looked at different areas, and tonight I'm going to deal with the area of character. And so let's, let's do a little bit of review. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 6. He says, Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? Um, the King James says it this way, a faith, uh, I'm sorry, uh, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And how many women have said the same thing? But I mean, God is saying that. That's not Pastor Jim saying it. That's God saying, who can find a faithful man? He says in verse number 7, in verse number or chapter 20, a righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed are his sons after him. You know, we, and, and I know I've shared a lot of this. I'm going to share it every time. But um, we were talking to our son, James. It was been a couple of years ago now. And he was working really hard. He was working long hours. And, you know, being mom and dad, we're watching out for our kids. And I know he's an adult. He's married. I'm still watching out for my kids. And, and Elizabeth said, no, James, don't let them work you too hard. And he looked at us both. And he said, that is not how you raised me. That's not how I grew up. And I thought, you know what, that's the truth. I mean, we would work. From early in the morning until late at night, whatever had to be done in ministry. Now go to Proverbs chapter 28. Because, beloved, whatever your core attributes are, you're passing on to the next generation. You know, when we started the church in Beattyville, I had a person come to me and say, you know, it just kind of makes me laugh because all I can see is a bunch of Pastor Jims running around Eastern Kentucky. And it so blesses me to see people, hear people saying the things that I say, not because I'm perfect, because I'm not. And if you question that, just talk to my wife a little bit. But I love it because I'm hearing word come out of your mouth. I hear situations come up in your lives, and you're quoting the same scripture that I would quote. You're saying the same things about it that I would say. And so he says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. A faithful man is going to abide with or abound with blessing. Go to Psalms chapter 15. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 15, and, and in this, in these verses here has been our theme verse for this entire series on honor. But I want to start at verse number one. It says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So now God, you, who wants to know? I want to live in his presence. I don't want to come in and out of it. I remember years ago, we had a, a young man in the church in Lexington that we kind of brought in. He was kind of like a son to us. I mean, we really tried to, to draw him in to be a part of our family. And he, he would and he wouldn't. He would come and he would go. But I remember one time he was spending about two or three days. He was having trouble at home. And he came and spent the, a couple of days with us at our house. And I'll never forget it because he came to the house. He walked in the front door of the house and he just stopped. He just standing in our front hallway and he's like, what's going on? He goes, hold on. And he steps back outside. And he comes back in our house. And then he steps back outside. I'm like, this is a little weird. I said, what are you doing? He goes, there is a, this isn't the word he used. He's a teenager, but he said, there's a tangible difference when I come in your house. I said, well, is it good or bad? He said, I can feel a difference and it's good. And that's where I want to live. I want it every place I go. I want to be like Peter, that I'm walking down the street and people are just laying people in the street and my shadow is healing them. Oh, Pastor, now who do you think you are? God's no respecter of persons. If Peter could do it, Amen. then so can we. And so I want, to stay, I want to know what do I need to do to stay in this place. Verse number two, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. I like that. I like the way it says it speaks truth in your heart. Have you ever had a situation in your life? I want to explain what he's talking about. Have you ever had a situation in your life that you're saying the right things, but you're believing the wrong things? Yeah. And especially when you get around other faith people, you're going to say what's right. But on the inside, you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever said. Anybody else ever done that? Yeah. Anybody know somebody who's done that? That'll help you. 
and speaks truth in his heart. Look, that's what I'm. That's what character is. Character is who I am down on the inside. Now I'm getting way ahead of myself, but when I'm talking about character, I'm talking about which one of you comes out when pressure is on. I mean, it is a is it a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? You know, think, as long as everything's going perfectly, you're great. You're worshiping God. This is awesome. And a little bump in the road and blankety, blank, blank, blankety, blank, blank. I'll tell you what, blankety, blank. Oh, I love you, Father. No, 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 no. It doesn't happen that way. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was... <laughs> it was... Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll call back later. <clears throat> He said, verse number three, he does not slander with his tongue. I'm not talking bad about people. Pastor and I were talking about some things going on in ministry yesterday. And we weren't we weren't slandering people. We weren't talking bad. But I got up this morning and I texted him and I said, Pastor, man, I'm sorry if I said anything wrong. He's like, Jim, you didn't. We, there's things we have to discuss that go on in ministry. I said, I'm, gonna make, I'm, I'm not afraid of doing wrong, but I don't want to slander with my tongue. And I'm definitely going to be very careful talking about other ministers. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate or a sinner is despised. Not the person, but their sin. Love, we're living in a, in a church society right now that is embracing sin. And they have this idea, well, we're all sinners. Well, no, no, I'm not. Oh, even Pastor, we all sin. No, wait, no, 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 I'm not a sinner. I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're not in break. We love the sinner. We hate the sin. But if you're not willing to change your lifestyle of sin, I'm not going to embrace you. I understand wanting help, wanting to get out of it. I'm going to embrace you and try to help you. But if you don't, God says... The Spirit of God will not always strive with the Spirit of man. That's what God says. That went over just as well. Okay. In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but honors those who fear the Lord. This is it. This is what honor is. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things, look at this, will never be shaken. But I want you to see that honor is he swears even to his own hurt and does not change. That's what my word should mean. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it regardless of the circumstances. <clears throat> now I want you to go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. and We're going to deal with this area of character. Because, beloved, I, I've shared this many, many times um, almost every year. I don't do it every year, but almost every year I go back and read the book God's Generals. And I, the one I like, I, I've read a couple of them, but the one I like is the original um, that was written. I don't even know how many years ago it was written. It was written by a, name, a man named Roberts Lairdon. It's not Slairdon. It's Roberts is his first name, Lairdon. And he went back and studied the great men and women of God, really of the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, that whole generation. And he studied what they did right, and he studied what they did wrong. And it was amazing how many of the men, and women too, but how many of those men of God fell at the end of their lives. And the problem they had was that the anointing took them places that their character couldn't sustain. Now, I want you to get what I'm saying, because the anointing will take you great places. The anointing of God, it, 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 it'll flow through you, it'll change people's lives, but if the character on the inside of you is not developed... That same anointing can destroy you. Let me explain what I'm talking about. And I, I promise you, beloved, I, un, I know what I'm talking about. When you flow in an anointing and your minister begins to grow and you become, for lack of a better way to put it, you become popular, you have people pulling on you and you also have people that want to worship you. Yeah. I, I, want, I want you to hear what I'm saying. And if your character isn't developed, you can give in to that. What happens when you minister, and you minister a lot, you're constantly giving out of yourself. You're constantly giving out. 
I, 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 I'm so thankful for the things that Pastor Callahan has instilled in me. And if you don't keep yourself built up, you empty yourself and you get down to what we refer to as your base feelings. It's like, have you noticed how much more difficult it is to walk this walk of faith to keep your stand up when you're physically tired? Yes. Can you agree with me? Is that true? I mean, you're not sleeping well, you're physically not doing well, um, you're, you're, you're not able to eat, whatever it is, and your body gets physically tired. It, I know it's a spiritual battle that we're fighting, but it's a physical battle, it, it's a physical body that we use to sustain us to be able to fight the battle. And so just the same thing when you're ministering, 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 and you can get behind, love it, I could have not slept for five days I could have done absolutely nothing godly today at all and still get up behind this pulpit and that gift of teaching would kick in. The anointing would come on and no one here would ever know. It. But when you give out and you give out and you give out, it's very easy to start feeling things that you haven't felt for years. It's amazing how many men and women of God that they'll come right out of ministering behind the pulpit and get right into sin. I heard one statistic, and I wish I could remember which one of the, the, the international preachers, um, you would recognize the name. He did a pastor's conference. And there were hundreds of pastors at this conference. And he was, he was teaching what I'm teaching now about developing character. And so he had arranged all of the hotel rooms for all these pastors. So he had a right to do this. He went to the administration of the hotel and got the information and something like a third of the pastors attending this pastor's conference were watching pornography when they got back to their room at night. Oh, wow. Wow. I, I, that's crazy. And he addressed it the next day. He said, I want you to know I went and because I have a right to do it, this is my conference, I arranged all the hotel rooms, I want you to know, a third of you are watching porn when you get back to your room. <laughs> now, I'd like to answer that altar call. <laughs> Those are people that have a gifting and have an anointing, but haven't developed character. That's what I'm talking about. Character is what the base of who you are on the inside. And the awesome thing is with God, supernaturally, you can change who you really are. I'm not who I used to be. I tell testimonies of things that I used to do before I was saved. And I have people come and say, Pastor, I cannot even imagine you that way. I have a problem with the preachers that give those testimonies. You're like, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> you know, you're not shocked when they tell you the kind of stuff they used to do. To hear William Bumpus give his testimony of this, I mean, he got caught leaving a house carrying a TV. That's how they caught him. And the, camp, the police came and he goes, I'm just borrowing it. I can't imagine him. I, you talk to him now, he's one of the most loving, soft-spoken people you'd ever know. And to know the life he used to have, dealing drugs and, and burglary and all that kind of you can change who you you can change your character. But let me give you a definition of character. <clears throat> it's the peculiar qualities. Now I want you to listen to this. This is Webster's 1828 dictionary. Impressed by nature or habit on a person which distinguishes them from others. These constitute real character and the qualities which he supposes to possess constitute his estimated character reputation. <clears throat> I want you to get that, though. Impressed by nature or habit on a person which distinguishes them from others. What's their character? Let's look at some scripture. I want to get into this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The anointing can take you places that if your character is not developed, it won't. It can destroy you. Let me explain something because I feel like I need to go a little further because you think, now, Pastor, you're sounding like the anointing's a bad thing. The anointing on my life is not for me. The anointing on my life is for the people that I minister to. That's how the anointing works. It's like I, I can flow in... I, I, don't, I don't mean I can. I flow in word of knowledge. I flow in gifts of healings. I, I flow in working of miracles. 
But it's for you. It doesn't flow to my body. It flows out to you. And so the anointing of God, he loves people so much, he'll use anybody that's willing. And so that anointing flows out. I have to work to develop who I am. Because the stronger you get in an anointing, the stronger you flow in an anointing, listen, I, I, I'm going to be real frank about it, you become more popular. And there's an, inter can, <laughs> there's an interesting thing about the anointing. <clears throat> when a man is anointed, women are attracted to him. When a woman is anointed, men are repelled by it. There's just, there's, I, we've watched it for 30 years. And I've talked to women, female ministers, women ministers that come in and preach for us, and they'll tell the exact same thing. And so the number of men who fall sexually in ministry is un, it's unbelievable. It's amazing the number of pastors that fall into sexual sin. And I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to deal with some areas of character that if you develop them, it'll never happen. Okay, let's... Do I have your attention? Y'all got some serious looks on y'all's faces. <clears throat> if your character's not developed, there's a popularity that comes with anointing. There's an area of... I, don't, I, I want to be real careful, but I want to be very blunt. There's an area almost of hero worship that can come because God is using you. And if you don't have character developed, it's very easy to fall in and allow yourself to actually get corrupted by it. And we can look at the number of ministers that have fallen because of that. All of a sudden, the word doesn't apply to them. All of a sudden, Elaine Homer tells a story about the most anointed man she has ever known in her life was the first evangelist she ever traveled with and was abused by him as a teenager. Now, when she looks back and to think now of turning your you know, 12, 13-year-old daughter over to a traveling evangelist, she said she would get in his limo he just get done preaching. People healed. I mean, this is the guy I told you the testimony. His son was run over by a truck. His brains were out on the ground. He scooped his brains up, put them back in his head. They took him to the hospital, and he refused to let them put him in the morgue because his son was going to be healed. And within three days, his son was normal. But she said she's traveling with him. They're done ministering. Hundreds of people are miraculously healed. They get in his limo. He opens up the center console and pulls out a fifth of whiskey. Then they get back to the hotel, and she watches as men and women go in to his hotel room. You understand? And he said, I get on my knees every night and repent. And if I didn't think God forgave me, I would never go on with my life. Now, repentance isn't saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is stopping. Mm -hmm. That's no character. That's where the anointing elevated you to a level that your character couldn't sustain. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> Paul's giving some instruction here to this young church. He says, rejoice always. That's a good one. Do you realize if you're rejoicing always, you can't ever complain? Amen. Amen, Pastor. Man, that's good. I needed that tonight. Because you know what? I've been thinking about complaining, but I'm just going to rejoice. So let y'all go home. I'll rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Well, that doesn't leave any time for complaining. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I just need to know the will of God. Pastor, I just need to know the will of God. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. He got his will. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. And look at this. Abstain from every form of evil. In all that, it says abstain from every form of evil. Now, let me read it out of the Amplified. Verse number 22, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're talking about character. 
abstain from evil, shrink from it, keep aloof from it, in whatever form or whatever kind it may be. Now, <clears throat> the, the King James says it this way, abstain from all appearance of evil. And, you know, religion has given you the definition of what evil is. You know, I know people, I wasn't raised this way. I, I was raised Catholic. You know, we, you could do anything as long as you went to confession once a month. Didn't matter, you know. You can be a mobster and just go to confession. <clears throat> but they put all kinds of labels of what that verse 22 means. Flee all appearance of evil. Pastor Callahan tells a story. You know, he got born again when he was five. He's going to church, and he's in high school, and he goes to his pastor and says, Pastor, um, a whole bunch of people are going to the uh, roller rink um, to go roller skating. Can I go? The pastor says, no, we don't believe in that. He said, we don't believe in roller skating? Why not? The Bible says, flee all appearance of evil. <laughs> so I'm not sure how strapping four wheels on the bottom of your shoes was evil, but the pastor said, okay, I want to please God, and he wouldn't go roller skating. So a little while later, he comes back and says, uh, Pastor, a bunch of kids are going bowling. Can I go bowling? No, can't go bowling. Why not? The Bible says, flee all appearance of evil. We're, we're pretty sure, after, you know, 60-some years, understanding, Pastor, 60-some years, I'm not even close to 60-some years, but that it was that ball knocking them pins over that was evil. That's abuse to pins. So they weren't allowed to go bowling. There's whole denominations that it's a it's a sin to go to a, a sporting event. Flee all parents of evil. Well, Pastor, you know they got drinking there and they got all kinds of sin there. I just choose not to participate. <laughs> now, when when we had professional hockey in Lexington, that was a sporting event that my wife and I came the closest to sinning at. We sat right down on the glass, and we were pretty redneck when the game started. But we didn't sin. We had a lot of fun. It says, flee all appearance of evil. <clears throat> now, I want to give you an example of what character does. Because when I, was, when I was getting this message ready, this is what kept going over and over in me. Um, since, we've, when I, since I started in ministry, there is a truth. I don't know another way to say it. A truth that Pastor has just worked to drill into us. I'll tell you a story to illustrate it. Um, you remember when we did the Bible study in Campton? And we did it at the library. And the first time I ever did it, I had no idea where the library was. You know, that metropolis of Campton. I didn't want to get lost. <laughs> and so um, they told me, they said, Pastor, we'll meet you at the Shell Station. You come to the park, we get off that exit. And uh, we'll meet you at that Shell, Shell Station. We'll show you where the library is. Now, all they would have had to say was, it's on the right, but that's okay. And so I pulled into the Shell station. Now, Tina's in high school. And they dropped Tina off at the Shell station. And so I pull up. We had that little minivan, that little white minivan. And I pull up, roll my passenger side window down, and she's pulling up the door. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to show you where the library is. And she's not right with me. And she, she said, well, how are you going to find it? I said, you better call somebody and get back here because you're not getting in my van. She was mad. I know, that's a sh I know that's a shock to a lot of you. She was mad. Some people at the Bible study were mad at me. And I said, listen, you got to understand. Let, let me give you, I, I, I'll explain what's going on. i got to read, I, 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 okay? Stay with me. We had a couple came down to visit us from Illinois. They remember they came to church here, young couple, and they stayed with us. Uh, Bree and Aaron and, and, and Elizabeth and I were at our house, and Bree and Aaron wanted to go see Christian and Jason at their house. They just live about 10 minutes away. And uh, <clears throat> so we get ready to go, and, and Aaron goes, I really don't want to go. And Bree goes, well, come on, Pastor Jim, let's go. And I said, no, you and I are not going by ourselves. And... Uh, she said, no, it's okay. And I said, no, you and I are not getting in the car by ourselves. And she just went, she put her hand, she put her hand, and she goes, what do you think I'm going to do, jump you? <laughs> you have to understand, because on the inside of me, all I need 
that night of that Bible study is me driving through the small town of Campton with a teenage girl in my front seat. Am I worried that she's going to jump me or I'm going to jump her? No. But there's something on the inside of me that, no, no, this isn't right. Now, there's another side to it. See, beloved, if I'm never alone with a woman who's not my wife, I don't ever have to worry about having an affair. Amen. I try to get it across to young people. Well, we didn't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, you did. Don't, don't tell me you didn't wake up one day and you were having sex. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You know, he was there, I was here, and all of a sudden, we were, we were, you know. <laughs> if you never put yourself in that position, you don't ever have to worry about it happening. Right. And so that part of my character has been developed. I'll never forget it. When Brie looked at me, she said, what are you afraid I'm going to jump you? <laughs> and I said, the interesting thing is, I said, you can ask her yourself, but if I had shown up at Christian and Jason's house, and Bree and I had gotten out of the car, my daughter had been like, what are you doing? Now the difference is this, is, this is why I wanted to use this as an illustration, that's just who I am. You come, if a woman comes into my office for counseling, the door stays open. Now, I, well, don't you bring your wife in? No, no, I, you know, people want Elizabeth and I to counsel together. If, if they want that, that's fine. But we, I keep the door open. Pastor Callahan will keep his door open if we're counseling a woman. We had one of our pastors um, here in the area that every time I saw them at their church, they were there with another woman. And I knew they weren't doing anything, but I talked to them. I said, listen, you can't do this. And at first they were defensive. And, and <clears throat> we had a situation that one of our pastors... And I'm not going to give you enough detail. Um, someone needed to get to church, and his wife kept telling him, just go pick her up, take her to the church. And he goes, I can't do that. Now, his wife didn't understand. What's the big deal? Now, to me, it's just wrong. But to this pastor, this was his answer to his wife. It's so It left such an impression. This is like 20 years ago, but it left such an impression on me. His answer was... I can't do that because Grace Ministries has a rule against a man and a woman being alone together. That's not, that's not character, that's legalism. I'm just doing this because it's against, I, I can't do this because it's against the rules. Go to Colossians chapter 2. I, I don't, I, I am so thankful that Elizabeth and I are at the place and that Pastor Callahan is such a strong proponent of husbands and wives traveling together. Um, I, I would still do what I do if this is what God had called me to do if I had to travel alone, and I did it for years. Um, I would travel with Pastor. Um, he and I would travel together. I'm sure people said they must be gay. But, <clears throat> I mean, but I'm so thankful that I'm able to travel with my wife. Because, beloved, I'm telling you what, you, most people don't know what's out there. And, and just like, I, it's amazing in ministry how women will throw themselves at you. I don't know another way to say it. And if that character's not developed, thousands fall to it. I promise you they fall to it every year because they haven't developed that who they really are. I want to say it again, that character is who you are when the pressure comes. If you don't like who you are under pressure, then work at developing the character of who you are. Okay, Colossians chapter 2. You doing all right? Is this okay? That is so funny. I don't know how it happened, Pastor. Yeah, you do. When I do premarital counseling, I talk to the couples about it. Be careful. Anyway, that, yeah, that's just not real popular. So we'll just keep going. Verse number 20. <laughs> Developing. The, that's the awesome thing. Love it. Look, if you don't like who you are when the pressure's on, then change it. Work on developing your character and make that who you are. 
I don't, I don't get upset. And, and the word is what's going to do it. It's, well, let, let me keep going here. Colossians chapter 2. He says in verse number 20, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men, these are matters, I, I want to get you understand where we're going. <clears throat> there are matters which have to be sure. The appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body. He's saying, why are you submitting yourself to all these rules? Jesus changed who you are. Now go, go to chapter 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now I want you to understand why I use these verses is I'm not looking for, okay, pastor, tell me, give, give me the rules of what good character is. The more, have you noticed this? The more you seek God, the tougher it is to sin. And the less you seek God, the easier it is to sin. I mean, back when you used to sin. I mean, you don't come right out of a time in the presence of God, caught up time in His Word, God speaking to you, and throw a fit. Okay, you shouldn't come out of spending time with God. Some of you are like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to. I remember back years ago, we were just getting started in this, and... You know, I'm, I closed myself in one of the bedrooms and I got kids pounding on the door and yelling and screaming and I come out going, Shut up! I'm trying to talk to God! <laughs> Didn't that, anybody else ever done that? I'm going to kill you, kid! God loves you! Go to Ephesians chapter 4. But it's amazing that the more time you spend in His presence, the more you see who He is, the more you want to be like Him, the more His attributes come into you, and you develop, you, 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 it's like by osmosis, you receive His character. I, well, I'm telling you, I've been in this for a little while, and it's amazing. People, stuff that used to really bug me about people. I was telling Jason on the way down, numbers don't mean anything to me. I, I, they really don't. I, I had someone, and I'm only sharing this because someone said this to us. Um, we were telling them about our trip down to Texas to, to see the woman down there to pray for her before she goes in for surgery. And, and this man just stood there shook, shaking, his, shaking his head. Shaking his head. And he said, I, that amazes me. And I'm like, what? This, what are you talking about? He goes, you will go preach to thousands around the world and you'll make a trip for one. I don't even think of it that way. I'm not thinking, well, you know, I'm going to look good for the people, and you know, got to go take care of this one person. And it's not. It's just I love people so much. And it's one of the most aggravating things as a pastor is you seek God, you get in the presence of God to find out what God's saying for that time, for that moment, for that people, and they don't show up. And I'm telling you what, I I I used to be a whole lot tougher than I am now because. You know, two days later, somebody calls you crying and moaning about the very thing you preached about two nights before. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. My character has changed. You know, there was, there was somebody just a, a while back that the Lord just laid it on my heart. Now, they, they've been in church. They've been with us. I don't mean us here. I mean our ministry. They have been with us for 20 years. And all of a sudden, you don't see them. And uh, the Lord just laid it on my heart. They said, just, just send them a text. Tell them how, how, ask them how they're doing. Tell them you love them. And a simple thing like that brought the person back into church. Now, you think you want people to mature to the place that you don't have to do that kind of stuff. But people just want to know that they're loved. They want to know that somebody cares. That's it. That's and then and to me it's like you know and so it used to be, but 
that I, I've worked to develop that part of my character. You know, Pastor and I travel, he'll go, Jim, there's just some things about you and me that are just totally different. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. I have no idea what you're talking about, how we're different. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. I love this because if there's things about your character you don't like, Ephesians chapter 4 is for you. He says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. We shouldn't be walking like the world. We should be different. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you didn't learn Christ this way. See, but when you got born again, the part of you that got born again was your spirit, man. You have access to God's character, but you're going to have to do something in order to change who you really are. Your spirit man is, is made alive. Your spirit man has been made right with God, but you still got that same mind, will, and emotions. You still got that same thinker, chooser, and feeler. And so he says, verse 21, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. I love it. God said, just lay it aside. That's not who I am anymore. But we've come up with excuses instead of working to change our character. Well, I'm half Irish and I'm half Italian. I get mad quick and I stay mad long. I, I don't hear him say it anymore, but Jesse the plaintiff used to say it. I got temper. It has something to do with that hot sauce in my bottle. <laughs> now, wait a minute. That shouldn't be our reputations. I'm not picking on him. I'm, I'm talking to us. We come up with excuses instead of working to develop character to be like God. Aren't you glad God doesn't have a temper? Uh, yeah, you'd be a little charcoal bricket by now. <laughs> Verse 23. I, I, stop coming up with excuses. But that's just the way I was raised. I've done marriage counseling. Nobody here. But I've done marriage counseling with people that will scream at each other. Every time they argue, they don't even know how to disagree. They just scream at each other. What are you doing? Well, that's how my mom and dad always did it. Well, how'd that work out? Not well. And they don't even know how to disagree without getting loud. I'm so th I'm telling you, beloved, after 31 years of marriage, we found out there, there's not much worth arguing about. Peace is better. I'm not saying that we cave into everything, but we found out peace is a whole lot better. But Elizabeth and I have both had to work to change and develop our character. And the only time we argue is when we take supplements. Gummy bears. I've got more comments about that comment. People watching online going, what was in them gummy bears? Couldn't be bad, they're gummies. They were grouchy grumpy. They, they were grouchy grumpy. I mean, they were grumpy bears. Verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, that's that subconscious part of you. That's the things you do without thinking about it. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, the new man. Now look at this, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Now let me, I want to show you something. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26. Remember what God said? Every man proclaims his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find... I mean, who, who has really developed their character to be a faithful person? And I love this, this account. When the Holy Spirit brought this to me when I was preparing this morning, I, this so illustrates. Because everybody wants to do good. And we do good until pressure comes. We do good until resistance comes. Because we're maybe you, we haven't developed who we are. We haven't developed our character to the place that it can sustain us through the trial. I'm not going to change. 
I'm not backing down because things don't go good. I'm not backing down because that's I've worked for 31 years and I'm not done. I'm just getting started, but I've worked for 31 years to develop this part of my character that I don't quit. And so now Peter, you remember this? Jesus said, um, "When are you going to deny me?" Remember that they're sitting down at dinner now. The prophet who has been reading people's mail for three and a half years meets the woman at the well. And she says, take, he says, take me to your husband. And she goes, I'm not married. because I know you're not married. You've been married six or five times. And the one you're living with is not your husband. This is Jesus who, they're walking along the way. Jesus isn't even walking with the guys. And he goes, uh, what are y'all talking about? Because they were discussing among themselves who'd be the greatest. He knew what they were talking about. And so now he's saying, somebody here is going to deny me. And Peter says... Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall because of you, I will never fall away. You notice how easy it is to make you stand to faith when nothing's on the line? Yeah. It's easy to decide what you're going to do when everything's going perfect. But when all hell breaks loose, what's on the inside of you is what comes out. That's what we got to work to change. And so, even though all may fall because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. You know, Peter was mad. Ah, blanket. So let's go to this, Luke chapter 22. Peter wanted to do what's right, but he, he hadn't. Number one, he wasn't born again. And number two, that wasn't who he was on the inside. Peter... He just had a mouth on him. <laughs> Luke chapter 22, verse number 50. I'm telling you what, that's the... Your character is directly connected to your mouth. That's the outward sign of who you are, really. What's coming out of that mouth of yours. Have you ever been talking to somebody and they cuss and, they, and you look at them and they go, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I do. That was another thing that Pastor really worked on us. He said, he goes, listen, guys and girls, be careful what you say out from behind the pulpit. Because if you say it enough, it'll come out behind the pulpit. I've listened to preachers cuss from behind the pulpit. But, you know, words are words. I, I travel places in other countries. Like, ah, we don't mean, you know, those words don't mean anything. It's the same everywhere. You know, they're just words. No, no, there is a difference. There's a huge difference. There's a connotation to the world that's very different. And so I'm very careful what I talk about. I had to get rid... I'm not against satellite radio. I had XM radio for years. But when I start quoting Larry the Cable Guy from behind the pulpit, it's time to get rid of XM radio. And that's what happened to me. I was, I was talking... And the Lord said, what are you doing? So verse 54 of Luke chapter 22. Having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. Remember he said, I'll never, I'll never leave you. I'll never fall away. He's already following at a distance. After they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, a little girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. But then he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. A little later, another saw him. You were one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was speaking, a rooster crowed. One of the Gospels says, Peter cursed and said, I don't know him. <clears throat> I want you to see something. Look at what verse 61 says. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. So we're not talking about Peter was out in the courtyard and, and Jesus didn't know what was going on. As soon as he did it, Jesus turned and looked at him. They were just across the room from each other. They were across the courtyard. Who Peter really was came out. A wimp. Whatever you want to call it, that's what happened. The, 
the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told them before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter wanted what was right, but he, had, he didn't have any character developed in it. Your true character comes out when pressure is applied. Go to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> what a difference the Holy Spirit makes. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all in the upper room with one accord. And look at verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them. He gets up and preaches a message that 3,000 people get born again. We know the end of Peter's life. Peter gets crucified because he won't back down, won't back off his stand for Jesus. He's a changed man. He's a different man. I love it, love, because if you don't like who you are, you can change it. That's what's so funny to me about people. So many people live their lives complaining about things they don't like about themselves that are easily changed. Uh, there's one woman that, that we knew years ago always complained about having bad teeth. Why don't you get it fixed? So did. Totally changed her. You know, I don't like my hair. Change it. I don't like who I really am, Pastor. Then change it. Yeah. Number one, you get born again. That starts the process. But look, if there's areas that I need to change, then I'm going to work the Word until that gets down on the inside of me. Because without your character being developed, doing right just becomes a life of keeping rules and regulations. Here's what I can and can't do. Pastor, tell me what's okay. You'll always fail at that. But when you develop character based on the word, doing right comes out of the inside of you. It's just what you naturally do. I'm just not a nice person, Pastor. You can change that. I don't like people much. <laughs> kind of tough to be a Christian and say, I don't like people much. When God says... Don't say you love me and you don't love your brother. Amen. He says they'll know we're Christians by what? How we love each other. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand.